Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, or whatever it is. Good morning. Uh, it's a very formal introduction. You should never write your own CV, you know, because it always sounds so dreadful, doesn't it? It's all right in writing, but when it's read out, it's like, it's um, awful. I just want to say, picking up on David's point at the back there, I think disharmony amongst decision making is a way we learn, and it's a good thing, it's a positive thing. I remember the time when IVF and humans was 50% of ethics committees were for it, 50% against. Same with organ transplantation. And why I love ethics is it's such a dynamic subject. It changes with time. So just don't get the aged ethicist with the grey beard. You need the young ones on as well. So let's just talk about this. I was quite interested in how this has panned out because a lot of my... Um, Some of the things I was going to say have already been covered, which of course is good because it saves me doing it and it saves me overrunning in time, but I may well overrun in time, so you'll, I'll have to subject myself to Miss Whiplash here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've talked about that and every speaker has talked about Article 38. Um, it's interesting, I just want to pick up on one or two points. I noticed that lasting harm is not included here, which could include death, and it's pretty lasting harm, but it could include making animals permanently blind or deaf, and so on. But for some reason it was left out, and that's, a, that's an interesting point. And this may ultimately be a very strange wording, and the UK wording is slightly better, but I had difficulty understanding and may benefit whether that was for the committee to just, uh, evaluate itself, whether it was going to benefit humans or not, or whether that described or accepted for the research book. Anyway, um, that's it. The preamble's interesting. It makes these points that animals have intrinsic value. Research use should be limited. That's an interesting it's saying it's a sort of, what do mean, set number of experiments. There's been a proposal that you actually restrict research by just limiting the number of experiments a year to 10,000, 1 million. And then people select, the scientists select which ones of those they think are the most important. I mean, it's another strategy for doing it. Rigorous project justification, well I hope so. Harms proportionate to benefit. Notional upper limit, that's something we talked about, whether it's actually there in practice is debatable. And independent harm benefit assessment, independent of who. Animal research is international, that's absolutely right, but there's no agreed methodology for animal research and looking at all the international legislation. And the harm benefit question, to me, still remains unanswered. You reduce all the harms, you maximise all the benefits, you're still left with the fundamental question, should the research go ahead? So I don't think anybody's found an answer to this at all. We need to convert harm and benefit into compatible units, and I'm going to suggest a way in which we can do that, possibly. It's very embryonic, um, so therefore it's not covered by any licence, you know, it's not more than two-thirds of the way through gestation. So we'll see. Harms are certain. I think we're far better at predicting harms than benefits. As a vet, I know animals are going to be harmed. I know the degree to which they're going to be harmed. I can be fairly certain about that. What's far more difficult is benefit. In fact, there's only one benefit that's 100% certain, and that's for basic research, where you can gain knowledge. You know you're going to get knowledge. The value of that knowledge may be debatable, but you know that the objective of gaining knowledge is going to be assessed and followed, and uh, I forgot the other, um, Shanks really wrote a book around that theme. Value judgments are inevitable, inherent in it. I like to think that only harms that are unavoidable should be assessed. In other words, you've, you've applied everything <coughs> to the level where you say you really need necessity to carry out these harms or to inflict these harms if you want that benefit. The objective should be real in some way or another and it should be acceptable. I say that because you can get I mean, Mary Midgley talks about you could work out the number of grains of sand it takes to kill a rat. That will give you knowledge and so on, but is that knowledge worthwhile? There is a conflict sometimes about the knowledge whether people want it or not and the reasons for which they want it. I'll come on to that in a minute. And the other thing that's interesting, isn't it? Do we look at the minimum harm, minimum benefit? Sorry, we look at maximum harm, but what about benefit? We're looking at the minimum benefit and the maximum benefit. What should we be balancing on the scales there? 
So there are, in Article 5, nobody I think has mentioned that, all these aspects are considered permissible benefits under the Act. And I think it would be generally agreed by all the speakers this morning that whatever the potential benefit, the work should be well designed and likely to achieve worthwhile and attainable scientific objectives. Because if it's not worthwhile and you're not going to achieve your scientific objectives, then obviously it should not take place. Criteria that are fairly easy to evaluate, and we haven't sort of gone into this level of depth, but it just strikes me it's worth doing. These are the sorts of things when I do ethics review for FP7 projects in the community. <coughs> we start to look at the scientific quality, and one of the scientific quality of the science is whether it's been peer reviewed. We could ask for the rating of the sponsors. We know that the MRC, the Medical Research Council, rate grants, but nobody ever says, well, what rating did it get? We only know those grants have come through, and it could be a year when money was rather plentiful or scarce, and you know, that might be a helpful factor. Research group performance. We have things like citation index, in what journals, the impact factor of journals, what grants have been awarded, what are the institutional support for it, and what personal awards, I mean those may all be things that are worth looking at, somebody's got a Nobel Prize, maybe better than a PhD student was starting off, maybe not, I don't know. There's a gain in real knowledge, um, and I talked about this, but David Attenborough in a program, whose father's building is just here on the campus, um, said a very interesting thing in one of his wildlife programs, he said, do you know, beavers can stay underwater for 7.5 minutes, 7.5. And what happened in the 1920s, they did a beaver drowning test. They held the beaver underwater to see how long they could survive. You know? Well, that was of public interest or not? Would that be permitted today? Research has gone on in the past, but you know, the public are interested in animals. And gosh, really, seven and a half minutes, it's a long time, isn't it? So, there's real knowledge sometimes. We also know that um, public interest and public sensitivities is very fickle. It depends what's going around at the moment. You look at SARS and the influenza virus and more recently the Middle East respiratory syndrome virus. Um, there's tremendous concern about another outbreak of influenza. So they're going to want to support research at that time probably more than they did um, a few years earlier when there wasn't that threat. Xenotransplantation is an issue that's there all the time. Research into animal welfare, research into TB, I'm thinking of badgers here between cattle, developing a vaccine for badgers. Research into companion animals, which in the UK includes horses, but not in many countries in Europe. Um, and the amount of pain, as Judy said in the sort of Bentham's classic statement. And we want to look at research and training. Are they technically um, trained? Are they competent? We can be technically trained to drive a car, but it's very different actually getting on the road and doing it. And what training do we give researchers into ethics? And I think that's important. We talked about having an ethicist on a committee, but actually what we need to do, as Judy says, is get it embedded in the culture. You need to make sure your researchers are trained in ethics. So in the EU, we have a standard requirement for when we criticise some of these things that they should really... <laughs> the researcher seemed unaware of some of the ethical issues. He should go on a course, you know, and make sure that other people get training in it. Criteria that are easy to evaluate for benefit is have they done a systematic review of the literature? A clear explanation of why animals have to be used. I mean, this is the non-technical summary, and I think so often that's missing, and that's, that really is very important. Um, the gentleman from the RSPCA, I don't know, talked about um, review, ongoing review. I think if you have built-in interim reviews, it's there all the time. You, if you're going to have an, uh, a severity banding, which is limited, you need to do reviews every day to see if it's been exceeded. So I think I'm looking for ongoing interim review within the project. Does the research group have a track record? Has it met its delivery deadlines and milestones? Has it got previous offences? When the condition under the personal licence was, does this, is this person suitable to give a personal licence to? How was that interpreted? Did they have a cruelty to animal prosecution taken out against them, where they found guilty, I don't know what it means, but previous offences might be important. Conflicts of interest. In cases when the 
animal welfare officer and designated vet is also the, the um, principal investigator. Is that accepted? And then fate of the animal at the end of the work. And I say this because I've got histories and stories about how some of these things have turned out to be important. <coughs> What we really look for is the use and development of alternatives. I'm really looking for integration of in vitro and silico and human data into the in vivo animal work. Because if they're interwoven, you're more likely not to have to waste animals to do the data. It's so important to actually look at, if you don't do a medical model of some disease or other, look at the signs and symptoms that humans show and then go back and look for those in animals. And the more you can make these congruent, I think the better your data will be. And that's starting to happen now in pain research. They're doing similar research in human patients and also animal patients. The difference between them is that you can kill the animal and look at the brain after, whereas you can't kill the humans and look at the brain after. And that's the reason for doing the research. But the fact they're doing, if you like, parallel experiments, I think, is really, really good. Benefits for animal welfare. Um, I'm looking to see whether within the application they're going to make benefits for animal welfare. Are they looking at trying to get a little bit of money out of this so they can make technical developments in the three R's? And then look at the history of model validity and its justification. Because you, you, you may have five or six models of rheumatoid or osteoarthritis, of which just two or three have actually been shown to go on and develop drugs. So why are they looking at these other ones? Once you have a choice of models, you can start to look at which causes the least pain. Right. One of the things that's fairly obvious to me is there's a difference between scientists evaluating <coughs> scientific quality and scientists who have expertise in the three R's evaluating scientific quality because there's a skill in that. It's an area of science in its own right. It's a bit like statistics. You need to get a statistician there who's well versed in statistics. And we need to get three R's advisors into this scheme here to look at um, the harms a lot more in a lot more detail. Housing and husbandry have um, been mentioned and that's set out in Annex 3, but when I look through, I'm looking to see if they're going to improve on Annex 3. Are they taking into consideration the housing systems and the husbandry of animals? Are, there, are these procedures they want to carry out under development? Have they been carried out in another country? What collaboration are they doing with people who, who looked at that? And then are they disseminating the results? Negative results as well as positive results. Negative results are not very sexy. People don't publish it. So how do we get the scientific communities to start publishing things that are, if you like, unsuccessful experiments? They are successful, but they're not really, if you like. Is this of interest, when I asked to, I'm asked to referee papers, is this of interest to our readership? Well, a negative result is actually not very interesting to the readership, but it's actually quite important if you want to reduce the number of animals. Can we make the raw data available to other people? How did they recognise suffering? How did they measure harms and so on? It's all, all quite important. So, at the moment, what you've shown from the various talks is they look at various criteria for, for benefit. They just say this, this, that. Um, the last speaker, Norbert, you know, you have some really nice things where they start to quantify that. And I think that's a step in the right direction. Because once you can start to notionally quantify things, you can start to get away from this apples and oranges to actually measuring things a little bit more across. Everything that you say is a question and very often there's not, we've got to look into the probability of them answering this question. What's the uncertainty around it? It's not an absolute yes or no, it's, a, it's possibly it's maybe 40%, maybe 80% or so on. So we need some quantification on that. Um, Great variation in skills across the world in terms of the ethics committee and how they do it. The interesting thing about that Scott and Plus paper was that the, the differences they got between the various committees. You know, I've forgotten that they got off and sent it back, but that was the differences. And that's the way that they learn if they disseminated those results back to the committee again. So it comes back to that educational side of, of this and educating the, the committee. Different approaches in the UK and the US versus Australia <coughs> in 
UK and US, they don't have animal protection people on the committees. They do in Australia and New Zealand. You know, try that in America and it's, it's like this, you know, but UK was slightly more open to it, but nowhere near as open as they are in the Antipodes. Journal editorial policies is another thing that uh, historical precedent journal editors receive things and they say it was alright last month or last year, but ethics moves on, humane endpoints move on. We need to get them on board as well, I think. So let me talk about harms a little bit. <coughs> I think the harms that you've got to assess against the benefits have got to be those that are left after you've applied the three R's vigorously. So only those harms that are necessary to achieve the anticipated or scientific objectives to be set against the benefits. These are harms that are unavoidable. Okay? If they're avoidable, it means you know another way of doing it better. Okay, so I would ask, 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 make the point that if you're carrying out avoidable harms on animals, you should be probably prosecuted for being cruel, because you know you could not do it if you did it another way. And it's a hard line to take, but I mean, I think it's a way of making people understand the problem to get more. So, <coughs> there are ways of deciding whether they're avoidable or not, but I think it's easier to identify avoidable harms than actually to identify necessary harms. If you look at, sorry, if you look at, um, okay, yeah. <coughs> deprivation of primates from water, I mean that seems fair enough, but how much water are you going to deprive them on, for how long? Those experiments to try and refine that so you cause a minimum amount of, of distress to animals, it's not pain, by the way. Pain is something I think we overemphasize pain. Pain we can treat. It's a question of people treating it. That's where pain needs to be treated. Distress is far more difficult to treat. Fear is probably the commonest thing in the laboratory animals, the adverse effect. It should not be pain. So, have they looked at the ways in which they're causing minimum harm as opposed to just minimize harm? I couldn't agree with that sentiment more. Criteria for harms. <coughs> you need a clear explanation of what will happen to each animal in a chronological order during the procedure and its impact on the animal. Let me come back and mention impact again. Those occurring in an animal's lifetime are important, especially if there's any deviation from Annex 3, because that's the minimum of standards. And if scientists want to deviate from that, they've got to justify it. But very often they can actually improve the welfare of animals. Animals live in their house for 100% of their time, okay? They're on experiment for 5% of the time. So the way the animals are harmed during their housing and husbandry can actually cause more harm to animals than, than during the experiment. We talked about reuse and continued use, so I won't go into that. So, let's look. Have the three R's been rigorously applied? Is the experimental design such that they use key experiments. I can go through lots of papers, I can say, you know, they didn't need to have done all these experimental groups, because if they looked at the high dose group first, or low dose group first, they need to have done the other 10 groups. The key experiments are ones that people need to look at in far more detail. Scientific and humane endpoints. And there's a hidden message for somebody in the audience, Q, K and V. Um, Statistics advice, that is a science in its own right, it advances. There should be the concept of having a statistician on the ethics review, the Animal Welfare Board, because it's a vital part, I think, of the three R's. And three R's advice, we've got all these people, Home Office inspectors, main vets in the UK, designated vets and so on. They build up a, an expertise in the three R's. And if I had to hang my hat on something, I think the UK system of having a home office inspectorate where they cover all the experiments, 20 people, 22 people, and talk amongst themselves is a very strong system. Holland had a similar system. Animal welfare officers in Germany and Austria and Switzerland maybe have a similar system. I'm not sure they get together and exchange opinions as, as much as they could do. But we need to develop expertise in the three R's and giving advice on experimental design. Right, 
Now this is the new stuff. You're going to be a guinea pig group now to a, a new concept. Not new, but new as it's applied to animal research. Is it possible to measure harms? At the moment we classify them into bands, mild, moderate, severe, substantial, and more than severe. Could we use another approach? Is expert opinion transparent? Because they can and do disagree. I mean, I disagree with David this morning about a lot of his interpretation of whether it was mild or moderate. And I'm sure Judy did as well. But there's no transparency. I want to get away from the point where you say, I think it's moderate, I don't think it's moderate. You know, that's a pretty non-productive discussion. So can we get a set of rules where we look at it together? And the, because we had that problem in farm animal welfare, the EFSA, the European Food Standards Authority, proposed a risk assessment approach to solve it. They were using it for other purposes as well. And the risk assessment is where you have a risk, which is the hazard, multiplied by the exposure. There's a hazard of flying by aeroplane, okay? One in a thousand planes crashes, so that's the exposure. If you crash, you die. So the hazard is death, the exposure is one in a thousand, and you can decide on it. You can refine that and say, well, it depends on the airline, it depends how far you're flying, what happens if you fly twice a month as opposed to twice a year, and so on. So risk assessment is trying to look at that concept of quantifying um, the risk. In classic methodology, we, the OIE, which is WHO for animals, do it for um, spread of disease, foot and mouth disease, for example. Codex Alimentarius has a risk assessment system for botulism and food poisoning and various other toxins and things like that. And what they have to do is to assess the likelihood of exposure, for example, so you identify a hazard, you look at the likelihood of, of people or animals being exposed to it, you then look at the consequences of that, how much, how certain are you about it, and you identify risk pathways. So that's a brief summary of what a risk, risk assessment is about. If we try and do it for animal research, then the risk is the hazard, which is the hazard of pain and distress, okay, if you take it to those basics. 100% of animals are going to be subjected to that hazard because that's the scientific purpose. We're not talking about anything in serendipity. You're deliberately doing the same thing to each experimental animal all the time. That's good science. And exposure is going to be 100%. Okay? But where it looks at this is the consequences. We've got to look at the consequences of being exposed to the hazard and the likelihood of those uh, consequences occurring. If you do an LD50 test, your low-dose group is less likely to have um, welfare consequences than your high-dose group. Okay? And even within a group given the same dose of toxin, you're going to get variation. So we need to, to um, look at that in more detail. So how do we do it? Risk pathways. We look at set times. So remember as a uh, uh, David is saying, so please use the word intensity, you know, because that's a key to it. Severity is a very ambiguous word. Severity is there are five recognisable classes, excluding non-recovery. You've got to recognise a normal animal, mild um, suffering, if you like, moderate suffering, severe suffering, and more than suffering. So to me, there are five different recognition states of animals. And then we've got to separate it into pain, suffering, distress, and lasting harm, the intensity of those things, how long they last for, and if you really want to quantify it, the number of animals that are exposed to it. It's done on an individual basis because a group of animals is just a series of individuals. So you do intensity times duration on an individual basis, and then if you multiply that by n, the number in the group, you can get the total amount of suffering for that group multiplied by the number of groups, you could do it for the experiment if you like. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So set intensity band recognition criteria. So you've got to say what those criteria are, and I'll come on to that in a moment. And then we can score it. So we say that they're normally get a score of zero, and then you can give them one for mild, two for moderate, three for severe, four for more than severe. Now practically, if you ask people, is it mild, your experts, most of them say, yeah, we agree it's mild. 
If you ask them whether it's severe, most of them will agree it's severe. So my background is in lab animal science and in farm animal welfare. Okay? And this is where you get agreement. Where you get disagreement is in the moderate pattern. Or is it high moderate, low moderate, you know, middle moderate, or whatever? So it's easy. What we do is say, it's not mild and it's not severe, therefore it goes into the moderate pattern. So you lump everything that isn't mild or isn't severe into that middle ground. And it's just a practical way of dealing with it. And more than severe, again, people can normally you know, cope with that. So, how does that get us? So, we get a description of the procedures for the risk pathway, and look at the times you're going to look at that. So, you can compare intensity at different times. If you have surgery, the time to look for pain and distress is going to be a day or two after surgery. It's not going to be a month after surgery. They'll have got over it by then. Okay, so it's, you have to do it at set key important times in the, um, in the experiment. So those have got to be identified. And you compare all groups at that time. Any intensity greater than the permitted band is then recognised. This is why interim review is so important and dealt with. You've got to score these animals in some way or another every day. And how often you do it in a day, I think most places will do it once a day. And for animals that are giving them concern, they might do it every hour. Practically, that's what can happen. Whether it does happen is another matter, but you know, that's how we do it. Okay, so how do we quantify these and how do we do it retrospectively, actually? So, how we do it is we get away from that mapping. We say, how does the intensity of pain and suffering and distress vary? What you do is measure the impact on the animal, because if it's affecting the animal, it will show it in some way or another. What they're thinking is more difficult. You know, how you can get inside an animal's mind, the symptoms, I don't know. But what you can do is to show that the animal's deviated from normality. And your control group has to be animals that have done nothing done to them. Not the ones that are given adjuvant alone, not the ones that are given saline alone alone, is those have had nothing done to them at all. And then you look at what the impact is on the animal. For example, an impact of an animal losing 30% of its body weight is going to be a lot more severe than one that's just lost 5%. The advantage of looking at impact is it doesn't matter whether it's pain or, or distress or whatever it is, because that only becomes important when you treat it, when you want to alleviate it in some way or another. So this gets over the classification of what sort of adverse effect is it. So impact, I think, is key to this. <coughs> two minutes. So, two minutes, oh, well, that went quickly. So predicted harms at set times, and severity then, because it's at the same time, and you start at the animals at the same time, is the same as predicted intensity. And then what you can do is to score it. So you measure not just body weight, you do several uh, parameters you've got to measure. Well, I've given some examples there, body weight, body temperature, body condition and so on. And then you can look at the average intensity by summing up the various measures that you've done, the total parameters, and divide it by the number of parameters so you get an average intensity, if you like. And then you total that for each animal in the group at that time. So. Do an intensity assessment at set times, then you can compare with the predictions. If you want to look at an animal over its lifetime, you sum them at these set times for the lifetime, because after an operation they're going to be in pain more within the first 48, 72 hours than they are a week or two weeks later. Nevertheless, it depends on what you're doing to them. So the point is that you get the total amount of suffering by looking at, by summing the set times over, over time. Total severity multiplied by the number of animals, and then you can compare with the average severity that you're seeing with the predicted, because the predicted you know is going to be um, those categories which I outlined to begin with. And we've done that now for several experiments, and I have to say it's working quite well. The advantages over expert opinion transparency, we've heard about. Experts have to justify their opinion, provides more detail and quantifies it. It's evidence-based, based on the animal, okay? It's more objective, 
helps manage the risk. You can see the times that are important for the animal. You can look at both individuals and the population. Okay. You can rank impact of different animal models, for example, how much harm they can, they can cause. You can weight the criteria. It's getting a bit technical, but you can do that. For example, those of you that have been on a diet know it's more difficult to lose the first 10% of your body weight than the second 10%. So, you know, you have to allow for things like that. And you need to add, oh, David Thomas emissions. You made some good points this morning. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking of the animals that didn't go on, you know, those things are really important ones, I haven't really picked that up, so thank you for that. Disadvantages. It's laborious, it takes time. Evidence often not there. And you can overinterpret it mathematically because it's not linear. You cannot say, you know, a score of eight is twice as bad as four or four times as bad as two. But if you rank things, it doesn't matter because you're treating all groups the same. So that's this, the point about this lower one as well. A high severity with low exposure may be greater than a high exposure with low magnitude. So you've just got to um, look at that. So benefits, we do exactly the same. So in this case, we look at anticipated benefit, the likelihood of achieving it, the magnitude of the benefit, numbers benefiting in terms of the population, and then we can, well, I won't go on to that. Gaining knowledge, I, I've just done some th things, but I think you can apply a similar principle in, in uh, benefit as well. One thing that I never see mentioned, but I think is interesting, we've already quantif uh, quantified benefit for human research by looking at quality. We could do it economically if it's going to be something that people are going to sell or employ people or something like that. There are ways in which we can. I think quantify that. I'm coming on to my summary. So, um, there we are, summary. Scraped under the, the pole without being shot. Um, so, harm benefit assessment is highly variable, depends on the ethics committee's membership and skills, and all that was quite right there, their culture, their experience, their biases, their social status, all sorts of things come into this. And we need to have better education information, dissemination of knowledge and so on. Risk assessment approach, I believe, will standardise this, standardise, harmonise criteria in their application, but we do need some more development for, for benefit. And just for these, I think these are two references here. The RSPCA booklet, I think it's a, a very detailed booklet. I know Jane's in the audience, but I think it's a really excellent booklet on this. And there's an EFSA guidance which you can get off the website on risk assessment for animal welfare, which I was a member of that working group, and a lot of this is, is based on. And I believe this is sort of an embryo of an idea about how we can go forwards to look at these things and quantify them in animal research for a heart benefit analysis. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.